Good, e good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining tonight's webinar, Entrepreneurship Through Acquisition 301. I'm Joe Cortese. I'm co-president of the Chicago Booth Alumni Club of Chicago and a principal and senior consultant with DeMeo Schneider & Associates. With me again this evening is Brian O'Connor, adjunct associate professor of entrepreneurship at Booth and founder and managing principal of NextGen Growth Partners. Uh, so this is our third webinar in the Entrepreneurship Through Acquisition or ETA series. Uh, we were joking before the call, we're two for two on my internet crashing during these webinars. So hopefully we don't make it three for three, but if that does happen, rest assured, I'll get back on as soon as possible. And uh, Brian's good at carrying the load, so he can just continue on without me until I'm able to join. But uh, in our first conversation around ETA, we discussed, you know, ETA generally, what it is, how it works, et cetera, sort of the basics. In the second webinar, we talked about the search process, how it's conducted, and important considerations to ensure the efficiency and the effectiveness of a potential search. By the way, links to the previous recordings uh, are available on the Chicago Booth Alumni Club of Chicago's website. So if anybody's interested in looking at those, uh, feel free to jump on the, the, the web page and you can, uh, you can get the links there. In this third iteration, we will focus on pre-acquisition valuation considerations, mainly valuation. Uh, we'll talk about the relative importance of different business criteria, as well as a few important considerations as it relates to valuing an acquisition target and structuring a deal. We'll take questions along the way. You should all see the question and answer box on the uh, Zoom screen there. If you have a question, feel free to type it in the, in the box and we'll, uh, we'll pick those up as we go. Lastly, um, I'll mention we will have at least one more webinar in this series. Um, the next one, which will be our fourth, will uh, we'll invite um, uh, one of the entrepreneurs and residents from Brian's firm to talk to us about uh, their firsthand experience going through the search process and uh, actually transacting on an acquisition. So uh, we'll save that one for uh, September or October. So with that, let's dive in. Brian, great to see you again. Thanks so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Hey, thanks, Joe. Thanks for having me. And thanks, everybody, for uh, dialing in. For those of you that I haven't scared off in 101 or 201, it's good, to, good to be here. Thanks for uh, having me back. Great. So, Brian, let's start tonight with, you know, just sort of like, okay, you, 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 you see the business that you would like to acquire. Um, take us through that process of how you begin the process. What sort of information do you want to get up front? How do you request it? Like just sort of start from the beginning and moving us down the acquisition path. Yeah, uh, so, so I think it starts with um, usually in ETA, and we've talked about in, in a prior session, the notion of proprietary sourcing versus any intermediary driven sourcing, right? And so I think the next step in that path is going to look a little bit different based on whether there's an intermediary involved in the in the transaction or the or the potential deal or not. And and I would say, in either case, um, you're going to want to start to develop a relationship and build trust with the business owner. And it's very likely the owner operator of that business. Typically, that is the case uh, with these smaller privately held companies. Usually, they're uh, sometimes they're multi-generational, uh, family-owned and operated companies. And so I would say that whether there's an intermediary involved or you're dealing directly with a business owner operator about the purchase of his or her business, you know, I think it, it, it starts with a high degree of trust and respect. Sometimes it's going to require, um, a lot of times it's going to require the execution of a non-disclosure agreement or a confidentiality agreement uh, just to make sure that you do have uh, that baseline understanding that their information that they share with you uh, that might not be publicly available is going to be treated uh, with, with sensitivity and confidentiality. Uh, so I would say that that's a first step is to execute those documents that basically in writing confirm uh, that you're a good person and you're not going to use their information any way, in any way, uh, harm them or share with competitors uh, or uh, go after employees or customers or that sort of thing. Um, so I, I would say that in all cases, it starts with building a trust and a relationship. And then you're going to uh, move down the path into um, information requests. And we can talk a little bit about some of the pieces of information that you're going to want to understand early on and request from the seller uh, or from the seller in conjunction with the intermediary that they've decided uh, to hire to represent them 
in the potential sale of their business. Um, but, but you know, it, it really does start with a uh, respect and a trust with, with the business owner uh, that you're the right person for them to be communicating with about something as serious and sensitive as the potential sale of, in a lot of cases, uh, their life's work. So, so, yeah, it sounds like it really is developing a relationship probably like you have to develop most relationships in business, I would, I would assume, right? I mean, that's you know, you, I, I liken it, I liken it to a very large strategic sale with a very long sales cycle. <laughs> and so critical in a sale like that, in this situation, you're actually purchasing, uh, but you are selling yourself as a potential buyer and op future operator uh, of that business in the ETA model. It's very much a, a strategic sale with a, with a long, uh, often long sales cycle associated with it. So uh, it starts with the relationship and, and, and trust. And then I would say uh, you, you, you then get into um, effectively striking a balance between getting information that you need to evaluate the attractiveness and the price that you're willing to pay and the structure at which you're willing to pay for that business with um, not overwhelming uh, <laughs> a business owner, right? Because um, this in this part of the market, um, it's not as clean and as straightforward as having, you know, uh, a very well uh, appointed confidential information memorandum often or a data room with all uh, the information that you could ever want to know about a business for you to be able to evaluate that as a potential investment. So it's striking a balance and a level of respect and, and, and um, understanding for that business owner that may not have the systems readily available or the information at their disposal uh, to share with you that you might, as a, as a Booth MBA, not be accustomed to evaluating when determining uh, the, the price and valuation and structure for a potential uh, acquisition. But I mean, I, I, I put those things in a couple different categories. I mean, first, uh, and probably obviously to a lot of people on this call, you're gonna want uh, to understand the financial performance of the company, right? So historical financial statements, um, income statement, uh, balance sheet, statement of cash flows, as far back as you can get them. Uh, and again, it's striking a balance between not overwhelming uh, a business owner, uh, but getting the information that you need to uh, evaluate to understand how, how is this business performed over long periods of time? And on as granular a level as you can get it, right? Monthly is better than quarterly. Quarterly is better than annual. Um, you know, granularity around the expense line items that uh, are uh, get you down to sort of your gross profit line and then down to operating income and EBITDA and, and then ultimately free cash flow, uh, which I would argue is the, is the most important. Um, so, you know, it, it is going to be around trying to get your hands on as much uh, financial information out of probably systems that are less than perfect at the target company. Um, we talked a little bit about the systems and how you get that information uh, as we move on in the conversation, but I would say it, it, it kind of starts there. And then, you know, you are going to want um, as much information as you can get on, on customers, right? Is this a business that um, is a uh, recurring revenue business model, which we've talked about in prior sessions, or is it highly repeat, or is it more one-time or episodic in nature, uh, and, and that customer data uh, is going to tell you about those uh, customer behaviors and trends and revenue profile uh, over long periods of time, hopefully, uh, if you can get your hands on the data. And then the third category that I would say, and there are many others, but uh, the ones that kind of come to mind are around the employees, right? What does the organization look like? What are the, uh, what's, what's the org chart? What are the compensation levels of certain people? And, and what are the potential gaps? And, and where are there maybe, uh, you know, the, the, the wrong people in, in, in certain positions? And these are all things that you're going to need to understand uh, from the information that a business owner is going to uh, provide to you, hopefully, um, and ultimately uh, factor into the, decision one, whether or not it's a, a business or an asset you want to pursue. And then two, if it is, um, how you want to think about valuation and, and, and structure for that business. And I want to, I want to drill down a little bit and we've actually got a couple questions here that speak to where, where I think we should go next. Um, and Kit asks, you know, is there a repository of standard docs that are used in the process or I maybe said differently, you know, is there a checklist? Like, do you, do you have a checklist? Uh, are there resources out there that provide a checklist? Because I have to imagine you can't just have one standard checklist. 
and apply it to every situation, right? I mean, these businesses are going to be different enough that you're going to need different things depending on the situation. And But are there some resources that you know of that someone could use to, you know, kind of make sure they're getting all the check the box items? Yeah, so um, it's a great question. There are a lot of resources available. Um, one of the texts uh, that we uh, assign in the course that I teach at Booth is the HBR Guide to Buying a Small Business. There's a number of good uh, resources and examples uh, in, that, in that book. Um, Stanford published uh, and continues to update and publish um, their uh, search fund uh, primer and then the, the periodic uh, uh, updated um, survey that, that they do around search fund investing, and that's all available on the uh, on Stanford's uh, Center for Entrepreneurial Studies website. Um, that that has one of the uh, appendices to that document is a very thorough and comprehensive uh, due diligence uh, questionnaire and checklist. Um, you know, we at our firm at NGP have developed uh, our own. I, I think that you know, and, and and several others. I mean, even if you did something probably as simple as a Google search of due diligence checklist or due diligence questionnaire, you'd probably come up with a whole host of examples. I think the 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 um, the real trick in 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 crafting that right curated list for each situation that's really where um, you need to spend your time. Right? You, you, again, again, getting back to the point of not wanting to overwhelm uh, a business owner with requests that might not be relevant for this particular industry or this particular business model, or frankly, they're just things that, you know, it's not reasonable to assume might exist or be readily available from an information or data standpoint within a business that generates two, three, four, or $5 million in, in annual EBITDA. And um, question from Lavesh. Uh, with regard to financials, how often are they certified or audited in this market segment? Or you know, do you find that there are, and, and that where I was gonna go next is, what happens if you can't get great data? So how often do you run across a situation where the data is good? And then if it isn't, what do you do? Yeah, um, I chuckled a little bit when the question was asked, how often are they audited? Because uh, the honest answer is like never. Um, <laughs> you know, certified and, and, and reviewed, uh, probably more um, than you know the instances that I've seen audited financials uh, in this part of the market. But um, the reality is, is you're dealing with imperfect information coming from imperfect systems, um, and uh, you have to make do. And and I've seen you know, and, and at least uh, one of the things we do we like to do at our firm here is we have the capability to request. Uh, source files. If they're running on QuickBooks, we request QuickBooks source files and build our own set of financials uh, based on uh, gap, you know, uh, accrual accounting as opposed to some of these that you see uh, different methodologies, cash-based or otherwise uh, used. So it's, it's always messy. Uh, it's always imperfect. Um, I think you have to be patient. You have to be understanding. You have to realize the limitations associated with the information that you're going to be provided and the systems with which you're pulling that information and data from. And um, in, in some cases, it's going to be a little bit frustrating for, you know, the Booth MBA that's used to, you know, having uh, a lot of information, a lot of data, uh, a lot of research, a lot of analysis. Um, it, it might not exist. You might need to make some uh, assumptions. And then I think that um, as you advance an opportunity, and we can get to this maybe later in the conversation, um, but you very are you very well are going to likely going to hire uh, a, a consultant, likely an accounting service provider uh, to do a quality of earnings. Uh, unlikely that you do sort of a full audit, but you're going to do a quality a quality of earnings to uh, really dig in and and verify that the you know numbers that you're looking at uh, are in fact. Uh, legitimate and, and, and the right numbers to be looking at. There's probably going to be some um, changes that are made uh, in arriving at the EBITDA or the earnings uh, or ultimately free cash flow that you as the buyer of the business are going to be value using to value the business. Um, but it's it's all the, the the only constant is that it's it's always imperfect. It's always messy uh, and uh, you know just to varying degrees. So have you ever come across a situation where, or what would you do in a situation where you found an attractive business, you really you know, want to pursue it, but the data is just 
terrible. I mean, can you move forward or would you recommend like cut bait and look for something else? Yeah, I, th I think you, ca you can move forward. I think it requires a lot of patience. It may require you spending time on site or gaining the trust of the business owner such that you've got um, an inside look or access into some of the systems so that you might be able to uh, suss out some of the things that you need to, um, you need to evaluate uh, the attractiveness and evaluation and ultimately the structure, uh, the price that you're willing to pay for that company. I, I would say the, the one situation where it, it does become just kind of walk away is if you have good reason to believe that you're being um, misled. If you're getting, you know, information that is uh, just grossly inconsistent uh, with, you know, your own findings and your own research that you're doing and uh, you've, your trust in the information that you've been given uh, is shaken and you believe that you're being uh, misrepresented in any way, uh, then, then you walk away. Or I suppose a situation where, you know, it truly is um, so difficult or impossible to get any information uh, as it relates to the financial performance of the company, financial uh, stability of the company, uh, then I suppose that would be another situation where it'd be very, very difficult to uh, assess the value of that business. Got it, thank you, that's great. Um, so let's move on and talk about, you know, some of the important considerations that, you know, you, you're, you're going to look to evaluate in these businesses. You mentioned a few, you know, source of revenue and, uh, and how if revenue is recurring or those sorts of things. Let, if you could just talk a little bit more about some of the, I know they're all different, but I'm sure there's a few key things that you're looking for and that you want to evaluate. And then how do you sort of, how do you place relative importance or how do you determine relative import, importance of those different factors in making your overall determination? Yeah, Joe, I think last time we um, had one of these sessions, we talked about um, the, the use of an industry scorecard when evaluating objectively the relative attractiveness of one particular niche that you might focus on to source deal flow versus another versus another. Um, I think the same applies here. I mean, my advice is develop a scorecard um, based on your own um, goals for this acquisition and those of your investors. If you're raising, you know, some outside equity capital to get a deal done, it's going to be important um, the, the, uh, to understand and bake into your scorecard and your evaluation how important to me and to my investors is um, things like, you know, lack of customer concentration and, you know, the, the revenue model, right? Recurring versus repeat versus one time or episodic. And we can kind of go down the list a little bit, but I, I would start by just saying develop a framework that allows you to quantifiably and objectively say, this business scores, you know, uh, 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 an 8.2 on my 10 scale based on these following criteria at these weightings. And objectively, that, is, that compares to a 7.1 of this business and a, and a 9.2 uh, in this business, right? That, that, I think that's the first step and not messing around too much with your weightings or those criteria to tell a story that you want <laughs> the, the, the data or your scorecard to support, right? So just being dispassionate and objective about the things that are important to you and their relative importance in their weighting and the things that are important to the investors that will ultimately uh, be backing you uh, in the pursuit of this acquisition. Um, you know, again, you, you asked about some of those things, right? I, I rattled off a few of them, like, you know, uh, you want to avoid customer concentration. I won't rehash a lot of the industry ones like, you know, cyclicality and industry growth. I mean, that's, that's really a separate scorecard than when you're talking about the scorecard associated with evaluating a particular business. So, you know, you might have things on there like bench strength and, you know, customer churn. If it's a recurring or re highly repeat um, service revenue model, you want to understand how often you're churning those customers versus how much stability year in and year out there is in the account base, right? There's things like history of profitability and growth. The longer this company has been around and heading in the right direction and generating attractive 
EBITDA and free cash flow margins, I would argue that the less risky that business is when you're stepping in as a new owner operator and, and expecting to you know, have that business continue on that same trajectory or ideally at an increased uh, growth trajectory under your leadership, right? Um, those are a, a couple of ideas. You know, um, competitive advantage, you know, does this business relative to its peers have some sort of special sauce that's gonna allow you to be um, effective in gaining share or winning new uh, accounts when you're the leader of the business, you know? Um, is the industry, I'm sorry, it, it, does this business um, play in a, in a space that's, that's fragmented or is it highly consolidated, right? That, that might weigh into how you think about this business's uh, attractiveness vis-a-vis -vis some of the other uh, peers that might be offering uh, similar type products or services. Got it. Now we've got a couple questions about you know sort of current market odds. Let's uh, hold off on that one a little bit uh, more toward the end. We'll get to that. Um, a question from Atri: How often are ETAs funded through outside investors, and who are the targeted investors, and and what incentivizes them? I think we've covered some of this, but um, you know, you as a founder of a of, a, of an ETA firm, a search firm. Um, how would you describe just the, the competitive landscape out there? Are you, are you bumping into, uh, uh, you know, the same competitors over and over again? Do you think it's a, a, a fairly, um, uh, you know, attractive market at this point? Or what, what are your just general thoughts there? Yeah, I, I think I sort of made this joke in one of our prior sessions, but like, let's keep this market a secret between this, you know, amongst us and this group. Um, because relative to the number of targets um, the level of competition chasing after these deals um, is, is tremend represents tremendous opportunity to those that are pursuing the ETA path vis-a-vis, -vis, say, what I would describe as a, a, the opposite dynamic that exists in mid-market or upper middle market private equity where, you know, you've got a finite number of targets and a, a tremendous amount of capital and buyers chasing after that finite uh, pool of targets. Really the opposite dynamic exists in this part of the market. You know, the, the, the breakdown between um, the different models that we talked about, you know, early earlier in ETA 101, sort of this self-funded approach versus a traditional search fund versus partnering with a private equity fund like NextGen. You know, I, I, I don't know the exact breakdown, but suffice it to say is that there's a broad enough universe of these opportunities that the models don't very often bump into each other. Um, and that's that, that tends to be uh, a good thing for participants, whether you're pursuing a self-funded um, uh, acquisition or, or one through a search fund or one in a, in a you know, sponsored or private equity backed setting. Got it. So sticking with the sort of the data uh, 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 topic for one more question here. Um, how, how much, how, so first of all, how do you or do you look to compare the target that you're working on uh, to other, you know, clearly other businesses within the industry? Can you find good data? I mean, at this end of the market, is there good enough data that you can do um, meaningful relative comparisons? Um, and, and how much of a, of a role does that play, you know, as you're, as you're evaluating a potential target? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it, it, like my answer to the um, information that you're trying to extract from the company, I would say it's a very similar response to that across the market, right? It's, it's imperfect, right? So it, it's not like you can... Uh, subscribe to a research resource and get all of the company's uh, public filings, right? These aren't publicly traded companies um, that have to disclose a certain amount of information every, uh, every quarter, right? Um, and, and typically business owners are, are quite secretive about, you know, because they don't have disclosure requirements, they are quite secretive about, you know, things like revenue and margins and, you know, earnings levels and even, employee counts and, and that sort of thing. Um, so you have to do a lot of digging and you have to do a lot of primary research, right? You have to um, find industry river guides and you have to attend trade shows back when people used to do that in person. Now, sort of figuring out this new normal, right? But I think it's, it's really kind of scrappy and boots on the ground and 
uh, having conversations with industry experts and navigating uh, that way. Now, there are some research resources that report on, and I know we're going to talk a little bit later in this about, you know, market valuations and that sort of thing. You know, there are, there are um, some groups uh, that, are, that are out there that report on transaction multiples and that sort of thing, but um, information on a uh, a comp set, if you will, for a target that you might be looking to acquire that generates 20 million in revenue and 4 million in annual EBITDA, you're probably not going to get a ton of just readily available information on um, its, its comp set to evaluate if that's a good margin level or a bad margin level for that industry or if that level of, you know, the, the level of customer concentration that exists in that business is normal and to be expected or you know you should be scared of that sort of thing it, it, it's really hard and I think it's going to come from a lot of hard work and scrappiness and boots on the ground and primary uh, research to get at some of that information as you're evaluating potential acquisition of one of these businesses. It makes a lot of sense. It's a great segue. I want to uh, move now to talk about valuation and, and, and valuation considerations and maybe we could start by um, and a question that came in uh, also talks about how do you think about valuation in the context of COVID-19 and what we've been through over the last, you know, six months or so. So let's start there. Kind of maybe take us through sort of pre-COVID kind of what you saw valuation. I know, you know, it's, it's hard to make generalizations, but if you could just sort of help us understand. And then how are you thinking about valuation in the context of a COVID world? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that pre-COVID, um, you know, the market for these smaller businesses, I and mean, let's just, let's describe them as being two to five million in annual EBITDA, plus or minus, maybe down to one million in EBITDA and up to, you know, seven million in EBITDA. I, I think for good business models, um, you know, you've seen those assets historically trade. Uh, if, if it's the first sort of institutional capital, I'll use air quotes for institutional capital, but it's the first sort of capital event for a privately held, family owned and operated type of business. You know, those businesses have historically traded at four to six times TTM EBITDA and give or take, right? There's, and it's very industry specific. It's very business model specific. So there's, but, but you know, that's, that, that's kind of the zone. And if you think about that zone, and let's just use for a minute EBITDA as a proxy for free cash flow, you know, before leverage, you're effectively buying that business at, you know, at those multiples at a 17 to 25% unlevered free cash flow yield, which is, which is pretty darn interesting, right? And then you uh, apply some leverage, likely in the capital structure, and you, you know, and that's just if you hold it, it doesn't grow. So you assume a little bit of, you know, growth, and then if you're lucky enough to realize some, um, you know, multiple expansion from where you bought it to where you ultimately sold it, all of a sudden you've you've generated a, a really interesting return. So there's a a nice, uh, what I would argue, a really attractive risk-adjusted return opportunity uh, in this in this type of mar in this type of model. Um, uh, at, at, at those valuations. Now, you know, now in this environment that we're in, uh, things have changed. I think that, you know, availability of third-party debt financing, it used to be uh, pretty readily available for these types of businesses, um, is not what it was kind of pre, you know, March of, of 2020. So that's going to have an influence on uh, what you can ultimately, uh, the capital that you can come up with to, to finance these deals and ultimately the, um, the competitiveness around a potential acquisition. Um, I think that good businesses that have performed, you know, in line with how they were performing pre-COVID are probably still, and we see anecdotally, I think the data is still a little bit early to draw any conclusions around this, but we see you know, pretty well in line with that zone. And in some cases, COVID has benefited some business models and they're sort of commanding a, a, a higher valuation than sort of that range, right? And the businesses that have really suffered, uh, I think it's, it's, it's too early to tell, right? I think you're, you're dealing with a situation where understanding uh, the, the new earnings profile of the, that business is going to be tricky. Um, evaluating a TTM period may not be 
representative of, of how this business over long periods of time is, is actually going to perform. You know, what does that do to the purchase multiple that should be applied to those or any historical uh, earnings streams? I think that's still all a little bit to be determined. And for me to share anything insightful on this call would really be too early and, and anecdotal, what we're kind of seeing and doing at our firm, uh, which is not sort of yet comprehensive or uh, illustrative of kind of what's going on in the broader market. Yeah, got it. Um, how, how is, I mean, I, I assume transaction activity is likely slowed down. Um, I, in other areas of the markets that, that I study, I've definitely seen, uh, you know, ground grind to a halt, but it seems like it's starting to slowly come back online here. Um, what's your experience in, in your end of the market? Yeah, Joe, I, I, I don't know that I'd say it um, any differently than how you categorized it for other parts of the market. I think that, you know, in April and May, business owners, would-be sellers, um, and, and potential buyers alike just kind of were a little bit shocked, you know? And so when that happens, I think that, um, you know, there's, there, there, it creates real large bid ask spreads and nothing really gets done. I think you've seen that uh, cool off a little bit. We, at, at our firm, we just closed uh, an investment two weeks ago. Um, the business has been performing extremely well throughout the recent sort of uh, turmoil and pandemic. And, um, you know, we were able to uh, come to an agreement around, you know, price and, and structure and all those sorts of things. So deals are happening. And I would say that it's definitely coming back in a way um, that relative to kind of April and May is encouraging and, and positive. I would say that it's still not back at the levels uh, that it was in, you know, late 2019 or this time frame uh, compared to the same period in 2019. But it definitely um, is coming up from that period in time where buyers and sellers alike were just sort of shocked and wanted to pause and evaluate, you know, what was going on. Well, let's just hope the rest of this year is uh, less, um, you know, uh, less eventful than the first eight months or so. Be helpful for us all, I think. Um, what do you do in the context of, of, of COVID in terms of, you know, you, you know, the, how would you suggest uh, working with an owner that maybe doesn't fully understand the impact of COVID on the business or, you know, do you, are there strategies to, to deal with looking past COVID and getting an understanding of how this business might perform in sort of this new environment? Any thoughts there? Yeah, the two words that come to mind are um, patience and empathy. <laughs> honestly, honestly I mean, these are these are not underwriting words, right? I think these are just, you know, uh, you, in some business models that have really taken a hit during this time. I think it's going to take a little time to figure out how they're going to recover, if if they're going to recover, right? And as a buyer, I think you need to be patient about that, and you might use. Um, though this is a different type of um, situation that we're living through than what sort of happened in 2008 and 2009. I always, always encourage people to look at companies' uh, financial performance over long periods of time. And if you can get that data from, you know, 2009, 2008, 2009, um, you know, you might find that a business uh, is quite resilient during an economic downturn. Now, this is a, is a whole different uh, situation that we're dealing with right now. Uh, but that might be a good um, data point for you to for you to understand, you know, and, and being empathetic to the business owner that, you know, may have gone from uh, three million in, in, in TTM EBITDA and now is like looking at two million in EBITDA. They believe that, that their, their business was, you know, worth six times uh, that TTM number and you believe it's worth four times, uh, you know, the new TTM EBITDA number, that's going to result in a, in a bid ask spread. And that's not to say that you as the buyer are right or the seller is right, right? It's just, I, I think it's being empathetic of the other person's situation, being patient about it um, and uh, following, you know, following the numbers and the performance pretty darn closely. Again, monthly is better than quarterly is better than annual. So really understanding how that business performs during periods like this and during this specific period, and then trying to understand what the KPIs are, what the leading indicators are um, for, you know, how is this business going to perform 
as we hopefully uh, get into the, you know, a, 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 a recovery period. And I would say that those KPIs should not be um, broad industry specific KPIs, but rather what are the very specific to that particular asset or that particular business KPIs that are going to give you visibility into what the next 6, 12, 18, 24 months of financial performance are going to be for that business. Got it. Uh, question from Christopher. Based on a five-year exit strategy, what are the industry standard multiple on invested capital that you're expecting or that you expect? Walk us through some of those um, you know, standard valuation metrics, if you can, please. Yeah. Well, every buyer has a different cost of capital. Um, so, you know, but that said, I'll kind of zoom off, zoom out and maybe talk about it in, in, you know, kind of more generalities. I think that for the risk that is inherent in this type of investing, um, which is, I would put in the category of, uh, more risky than mid market or upper middle market, private equity, leverage buyout type investing, but decidedly less risky than, you know, new venture or venture investing. Um, you know, it's, it's, I, I, I like to describe it as a risk adjusted approach toward entrepreneurship because uh, you're buying an existing business with existing assets and existing customers and existing employees. And although all of those great things represent risk mitigants, but you know, long winded way of saying, I think that, you know, over a five year period, um, if you were to be able to, uh, underwrite to somewhere in a three to four times multiple uninvested capital at the asset level. Um, I think that's, that's a pretty interesting, um, you know, risk level of risk adjusted return. Uh, you know, again, there's multiple data points in my answer here, but um, a lot of them go way better than that. Uh, and a lot of them, unfortunately, don't go that well or don't even return, uh, you know, one times invested capital. And that's obviously not a good, um, situation for anyone to be in, but you know that that's sort of the zone that I would think about as an appropriate um, level of uh, risk adjusted return or MOIC over a over a five year holding period. Very helpful, thank you. Uh, another question that came in, uh, I think I probably know the answer to this, but um, how, how do sellers who might be interested in selling their business approach a governing body or council that helps them certify to be attractive for an acquisition? Or I guess at this end of the market, are there do businesses certify? Are there ways to do that? Or my thought is probably not too many given the size of the businesses that you're looking at, but who knows, I might be wrong. Yeah, what we have seen uh, occasionally and not often, so very occasionally, is uh, a business owner that is thinking ahead, thinking proactively about selling their business, whether they've engaged an intermediary, an investment bank or a broker uh, to assist in that process, do a, a proactive quality of earnings um, such that, you know, when a prospective buyer comes along like us and says, well, we need to take a look at the financials of the business, it's, it's in order. And, and we sort of say, okay, gosh, well, uh, this has done, been done proactively and the numbers are cleaner relative to, you know, the hundred other assets that we've sort of looked at in this you know, space or uh, related to this company. Um, and, and, that, and that represents a risk mitigant in the eyes of a potential buyer, right? So you have seen uh, more, I would say more and more uh, by, uh, sellers, business owners, small business owners, proactively engaging the services of an accounting firm. Um, and it's probably not a big four. Uh, the price tag associated with big four usually is incongruent with the size of these businesses, right? But it's a mid-market uh, accounting firm that you would proactively engage as a business owner to uh, make sure that your sort of books are in order and uh, that it's in a, in a form that is going to be uh, digestible and uh, viewed as um, something that, that a buyer can get their arms around proactively instead of waiting for those tough questions that come from all of you as smart booth grads that are going to be digging into the numbers. Got it. Um, one more question on valuation before we switch to sort of structuring and, and thoughts there. Um, what are some of the, the things a business can do or in your experience that you've seen businesses do um, both poorly in terms of valuation, like some things that some things that have been missed that can 
significantly affect valuation on the negative side versus are there some things that businesses can do that are high return in terms of fairly easy things um, that, that, that really help increase the valuation? Maybe that's too general of a question, but just wondering your thoughts. Well, let's, let, let's see where it goes. I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reference something we talked about earlier, which is, you know, we looked at that scorecard through the eyes of a, of a buyer, right? That's really the perspective that we're taking in this chat. But through the eyes of a seller, think about those things that are going to be most attractive to the buyer, potential buyer of your business that is, is going to make your asset irresistible relative to the alternatives for their time, attention, and, and capital, ultimately, right? So things like, you know, trying to mitigate for uh, customer concentration and, 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 and drive, you know, repeat and ideally recurrence and contractual recurrence in your revenue streams and, you know, um, uh, illustrate through the, through the financials the existence of operating leverage in your business, right? And, and creating something that's special and unique and defensible and offers a, a compelling ROI to the customers that ultimately use your products or services relative to your competitive kind of peer set, right? Building out a, a, a bench, right? A, a, you know, a, a depth of the organization behind that key man or woman that has been responsible for founding and the growth and scaling of that business so that a buyer views that as a company that's got some bench strength, right? Uh, that, it's a, that it's a real organization and it doesn't have key man or key woman risk uh, as they think about inserting themselves into that business as the new owner operator of that company. I mean, those, those are, I'm, I'm basically taking the scorecard and, and, and flipping the perspective on it um, and, and saying, well, listen, as a business owner, you want to make sure that you're busy and you're never going to check all the boxes, right? No, no business is ever perfect, uh, especially in this part of the market, but trying to do the things that you know uh, uh, that are, that are going to make your uh, business uh, irresistible relative to the alternatives where, uh, you know, time and capital can be invested from a, from a buyer standpoint. And do you get, when you're looking at businesses then, just to kind of turn around back to the, the, the buyer and the acquisition side, um, do you sort of think about and identify, you know, and clearly this probably goes into the, uh, you know, sort of the post-transaction potential of these companies. What are some of the key things that the, buy, that the business owners have missed that you could come in and quickly and efficiently bring online to, you know, drive value creation very early on? Is that part of the acquisition plan? Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's like the couple of pages in the investment memo around, you know, value creation levers that might be available to the new owner, right? The, you know, so sometimes we're naive enough as buyers to sort of categorize those as low hanging fruit as if like a, a really savvy business owner that's been operating in this industry for 30 years hasn't like identified the low hanging fruit. <laughs> right. So it's a very naive sort of exercise, but, but listen, the reality is, is these businesses aren't perfect. Um, they're not totally efficient. Um, and so, yeah, critical Joe to, um, an investment thesis is okay. Well, like we've bought something that hopefully is healthy and has a history of profitability and growth and stability and first order of business. We've talked about this before. First order of business is I'm going to buy this thing and not screw up what like has been working for years and often decades. Like th that, that's the first, but then you know, as we settle in, to being the new owner operator of this company, what are those value creation levers that we might have available to us? And it's going to be different from asset A to asset B to asset C. Um, you know, the one might, you know, have uh, an opportunity to really build out and commercialize uh, sales, marketing, and BD function, right? You know, one might have an opportunity to take a blueprint that they've proven out in a particular geography, if it's a, maybe it's a footprint business and 
we need to evaluate, okay, how difficult would it be for us as the buyer of that business to take that blueprint, maybe make some improvements on the margin to it, but very likely we're buying from a shrewd operator that's been in the industry for a while. How easy is it going to be for us to take that blueprint and apply it to a, a potentially new geography or a tangential customer segment? Um, yeah, those all for sure uh, you're going to want to be thinking about as you're making this investment because that effectively becomes your, you know, 100-day action plan and your first-year operating plan and, and really the plan that probably guides, you know, your activities and your priorities and the way that you build your team and how you invest into systems over the holding period of that business. And of course, it's going to change. You're not going to get it all right pre-acquisition. You're going to learn a tremendous amount post-acquisition. Hopefully you, you know, you, you underestimated how great the business is as opposed to, you know, bought something that is far less attractive than you thought it was. Um, but that, that plan is going to change. You absolutely have to have uh, the, the, the initial framework and the, um, uh, and the, and the, your assumptions around what those things uh, are that are going to be available to you to, to grow that business after you uh, acquire uh, uh, we actually do have one more valuation question from Somesh. Uh, how do you value intangibles that have yet to provide material results, impact, profitability, cash flow, for example, technical innovation, patents, those sorts of things? Does that come up a lot? Um, not as much as you'd think. And, you know, uh, it, it's very difficult. We're, we're now getting into a zone that is frankly way above my pay grade. It becomes sort of venture capital investing. So how do you put value on uh, a, 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 a technology or an idea or a system that is yet to be fully commercialized or monetized? And that, that's, that's a topic uh, for another session that I have no business leading, right? So re really, I, I, it's tough in, ETA style investing to ascribe a meaningful amount of value to that it's just a model that's not well set up to um, really pay for, frankly, uh, I'll pay a lot for those types of intellectual properties or systems or technologies that have yet to be uh, commercialized. Listen, if you if you if you can acquire them and you believe there's value in them and that it compels you to pay incrementally more for that business uh, because you have a unique skill set or an ability to vet whether or not that is a very unique and valuable piece of intellectual property, then, then, then great. I mean, I, I, the, all, all the power to you. Um, but I, again, I, I think about things through the lens of risk. And if that is something that you're going to pay a meaningful uh, amount of purchase price or sale consideration for and is yet uh, to bear uh, fruit or, you know, produce economic results associated with it, that to me jumps out as like a big, a big risk in the purchase price and structure. Got it. That's helpful. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left. So let's get to the final portion of what we wanted to discuss tonight, sort of structuring the transaction. Um, can you take, uh, you know, I'm sure every deal is unique, but, you know, are there some typical things that you see on the structure side um, what are some of the, you know, uh, common structures that you see, you know, how, did, how does it get negotiated? Let's kind of start uh, general and then we can dive down into a couple of the other. Yeah, sure. Um, I would say, I guess at, a, at the highest level, um, do what you can to keep it simple. <laughs> because the more complexity you add into a capital structure, I think the more opportunity that you have for, future disagreements between buyer and seller and we can talk about sort of what I what I mean there but I, I think you know you often see relatively straightforward and simple simple um, structures uh, as it relates to the the, the the purchase of these businesses so there will typically be um, a, a component of, of debt you know probably third party debt maybe uh, seller financing which I would put in the category of seller note uh, I put that in the category of, of debt though it's not you know really third party debt um, you know that's that's again I'm using kind of rough numbers here just like the valuation ranges that I that I shared with you it's, it's of course there's examples above and below this but you know that would constitute 50% of the capital structure so think about a you know a, a, a 
$2 million EBITDA business, bought it five times, 10 million in total enterprise value. You know, you might have two, two and a half terms of, of debt, you know, third-party debt, seller financing or some combination thereof. So $5 million of the total uh, $10 million sale consideration uh, might be in the form of, of debt. You know, the, the, the equity typically will come from uh, you potentially as, as the, uh, as the, investor that's going to lead the operational charge. It's probably going to come from a group of investors that you've raised money from. You might have some equity in that part of the uh, cap table that is rolled equity from the seller, really uh, creative and nice way to align interests with the seller, um, if that's important to the thesis going forward, um, and minimize the amount of uh, cash that you need to bring uh, to the closing table. Um, though you're giving up, you know, some of the upside, right, in uh, allowing the, the seller to roll typically uh, pari passu with you as the buyer uh, in the in the uh, newly formed uh, capital structure. Um, you know, and then you get into things like um, earn out and contingent payment. Um, you know, those I mentioned last because they tend to be tricky. <laughs> uh, they tend to be hotly negotiated uh, pre-acquisition for sure. And then when they don't play out according to plan, meaning uh, they're not paid out from buyer to seller, they often result in uh, disputes and sometimes litigious disputes. And that's no fun for anyone. Um, so again, I go back to like keeping it simple. I think that some of those um, burnout and some of that creative structuring, contingent payment, uh, and that sort of stuff is becomes an effective tool um, when you're trying to creatively get to yes with a seller. You know, if they just believe that their business is worth, you know, you arrive at the same TTM EBITDA number, you've figured out, you know, kind of what that is and buyer and seller agree on that, but they believe their business is worth six times and you believe it's worth five, right? You know, we, we, we've seen earnouts be effective in those types of situations that sort of say, okay, listen, if the business continues to perform or it hits hurdle X, Y, or Z in the future, we'd be happy to pay you uh, that additional turn of EBITDA. But, but, you know, in the event that it doesn't, we have to have some uh, downside protection on our purchase price. And so creatively coming up with an arrangement to bridge uh, the bid ask spread between buyer and seller, you can use uh, tools like that and they are uh, used in this part of the market. It's really interesting. Are there any specific structural aspects that you would just say avoid full stop? Like we would never do this. Um, we've never seen it work out. Any, anything like that? Yeah. Um, I, I guess I don't, I, I don't have a, a good example there. I mean, it's, it's probably my guidance on that would be be really honest with yourself about the facts and circumstances around those contingent future payments and earnouts, because they they can they can get really contentious, right? Like if you've taken operational control of a business and you've got an earnout that's tied to a future 12 months, 24 months down the road, EBITDA target, you can see how there might be a dispute between buyer and seller around, well, if you had operational control of the business, you did X, Y, and Z, and I would have never done that with my business, or I would never, never have invested into that system and drove down sort of EBITDA in the short term, right? So you get, it, it, it gets really tricky. So I think the, the biggest um, mistake I see people making in this part of the market is thinking too naively about um, the use of earnouts and how they can solve all gaps between buyer and seller without thinking through the potential future implications uh, around, um, okay, what if things don't go exactly according to plan? Uh, because they very rarely <laughs> never go exactly according to plan. They either go sort of better or worse than, than plan. I'm sure. Um, uh, one quick question here. Uh, what is the maximum leverage even a multiple that you believe is prudent? Do you have, I mean, is it, do you, do you have sort of a, this is, this is, I wouldn't go any higher than this, or does it just really deal dependent? 
Yeah, I, I, I'm, I don't have a hard and fast rule on that. I, I think that typically, given the ro risk profile associated with these businesses vis-a-vis -vis their, you know, 10, 20, $50 million EBITDA counterparts that are just larger organizations and, in, and inherently less risky, I would say favor a capital structure in, in this part of the market that is more conservative than some of the, what I would categorize as aggressive uh, use of leverage capital structures that you see uh, up market. So uh, be, conser be conservative. You're going to um, gonna probably benefit. You might, in an upside scenario, uh, trade a little bit of your return or your IRR by not pushing it uh, on the leverage. But in the scenario where it's uh, tight, <laughs> you're, you're going to want that breathing room and the room in the covenants and the room in the free cash flow uh, to make the investments and the operational flexibility that, that you really need in, in these small businesses. Great. So uh, just a couple of final minutes here. Um, just if, if you wouldn't mind, take us through a structure that, you, that you've done or you've seen that you just thought was really interesting or that really worked out well. Give us an example of something you've done where you've, where you've been uh, really pleased with how it turned out. Yeah. So um, uh, absolutely. So uh, a $4 million EBITDA business um, bought at just above five times. Let's, for simplicity's sake, let's call it five times. Um, a, about 50% or, you know, $10 million of the $20 million enterprise value um, came in the form of uh, a third-party note, senior secured financing. On top of that, again, included in that $10 million of debt financing was a piece of seller financing. Um, typically, that's a very attractively priced covenant-free piece of paper um, that, you know, sits subordinated in the capital structure to your sort of senior secured. So that was an, an, that's a nice little component of debt. And uh, it, it tends to have some of the added benefit of aligning interests with, with seller post acquisition. Um, and then on the equity side of the ledger, um, all of our, uh, all of the capital uh, went in as a participating preferred equity security alongside Pari Passu, some rolled seller uh, equity uh, rollover as well. And the, and the cool thing about that seller equity rollover was that we were able to, by painting a, a picture and not an unreasonable picture of what future existed ahead of this business under the partnership, and it's a continued partnership with the selling principal shareholder uh, operationally going forward, that that, that, that that rolled equity component that is a minority equity position in the capital structure um, was going to be worth a meaningful amount, right? So you sometimes ca characterize this as a second bite at the apple, right? For a selling shareholder. And you got a really nice alignment of interest around uh, growth and that, uh, that seller, um, former principal shareholder, former operator um, supporting you and as the operator and your investor group in the continued growth because uh, they're participating in, ec in it economically. Um, and that's a, that, that was and continues to be a situation that um, represents a, a, a lot of alignment. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's relatively simple in the sense that there aren't a whole bunch of different contingent payments or earnouts with tiers and, and hurdles and confusion around did we hit them and did we not and that sort of thing. Um, so I guess I guess I guess that would be an example that I would I would reference as one that uh, you know uh, we've had some success with. Very very interesting. Thank you for taking us through that. We've uh, we've reached time. It's been a fast hour. Thank you as always for agreeing to uh, chat with us here tonight. Really appreciate uh, your 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 uh, your input once again. <clears throat> I want to thank everybody that's joined us this evening. Remember, we will have at least one additional uh, webinar in this series. The next one, we'll invite uh, one of uh, the entrepreneurs and re residents from Brian's firm to share some some of their experience with us and, and and go from there. So again, Brian, thank you so much. Really appreciate the time this evening. It's It's been wonderful as always and look forward to chatting with you again soon. And thanks everyone for joining. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Take care.